Waffle House is releasing its own beer. Do what? Waffle House. Called Bacon and Kegs. <laughs> That's not as funny as I reacted. I sent it to Sean. He loves Waffle House. So I just want to point out the differences between Sean and I as humans. Yeah. I am very happily drinking my mimosa out of a mason jar because this is what I'm most comfortable drinking it out of. <laughs> we have an extensive amount of glassware in this house, but yeah. I go with the mason jar. And this mimosa is mango, nectar, and like a peach puree that mm-hmm. I found today. So it's a little like the juice portion is thicker. So I gave it a little stir and I used a fork because that was the first utensil I grabbed out of the drawer. That helps blend it because there's a little pine for it to float with it. Right? It's like whipping it. Yeah. Sean, however, I saw him drinking a similar mimosa out of a pint glass. Fine, whatever. And he has mm. like our bar spoon out on the counter next to the mimosa stuff. Like, my fork wasn't good enough for him. He had to get the fancy bar spoon out. Here's my evaluation, is that the mason jar is the catch-all for any way. Whereas, doing a mimosa should be in a flute, but if you don't have a flute, I would I would default to the mason jar before I default to the pint. Well, here's the thing. A flute doesn't hold enough. You were there the time I accidentally spent $200 on mimosas for three people. <laughs> Welcome to Foods and Spirits Podcast. I'm Kate McDonald. I'm Nick McDonald. It's like a drink with death. And there's a dog licking my face. Um, This week we're going to talk about camels. Camels. I mean, there's more to it, but I really just want to hyper-focus on the camels. <laughs> so we've got some good camel stories. We've got some good uh, mining stories, I guess. Denver's gold in them there, Hills. And then we have a... Camel mining drink? Camel a, sparkling, a sparkling taste on camel, camel mining? Camel mail. Camel mail. That'll make sense by the time we get to the drunk. Don't worry about that. I wish I'd found another haunted camel, but I'm not that good. <laughs> I do have a weird camel murder story, though. Yeah? Because Southern Oregon. <laughs> apparently, like, I didn't even, like, look into this. I just remembered... I heard this not too long ago. Apparently, there was, like, a multiple homicide, like, out in um, in the parts of the county you don't go to. <laughs> Delwood region. Should I, should, am I, is that inappropriate for me to say, like, the Cave Junction area? Um, <laughs> <laughs> cut that out if it is. But apparently, there was, like, multiple homicides one time. Like, in the last couple of years, I believe. Like I said, did not go and invalidate the story, but based on where it's coming from, this all makes sense. So some guy murdered his neighbor's camel because, yes, this guy just had a pet camel. So the guy, like, who had the camel, I believe murdered the guy that murdered his camel and, like, that guy's, like, son or brother or something. So it was a multiple camel homicide. An eye for an eye, two bodies for two humps. I mean, yeah. It must have been a, I want to say a Bactine candle. Camel. Bactine candle. I'm going to add that to my Etsy shop. Bactine candles. <laughs> Just in time for COVID round two. You could do like a whole nativity candle set. I said Bactine. I'm making antiseptic candles. Not these dumb camel candles. <laughs> Bactrian. I was not that far off. <laughs> I, I... I figured you knew what you were talking about, and I heard back to and I go, well, that doesn't sound like the right word, but I don't know. Well, I could remember to, dromedary. I don't know wrong, so I'm going to let her roll with it. Well, because I like to keep people educated. You know how you tell the difference between the camels? How? No. Dromedary candles have one hump, so it looks like a D turned on its size, and Bactrian camels have two humps, so it looks like a B on its side. Mm. And Bactrian camels wear a mask and wash their hands nine times a day. And are slightly orange tinted. Yes. <laughs> more fun facts with Kate. <laughs> is there more to this story other than camel revenge or what? Oh but that was that was it. I feel like I should Google it. See if it's Oh 
It's a real story. Camille the camel shot to death in Cave Junction. <laughs> so this happened in 2017. People Cave camel. Junction, Oregon. I'm going to read you the news story. An Oregon Preservation Center says a camel has died after being injured in a southwestern Oregon shooting last week. My version of the story is way more fun where it's a pet camel. <laughs> the camel named Camille was standing across the highway when a man opened fire in Cave Junction on July 1st. Please say one man was injured and one dog was killed in the incident. Robert Ringo with the Tiger Preservation Center. Yes, we have our own tiger center. I believe it's on Joe Exotic's level of weirdness. It will have to but be I cannot camera. confirm nor deny. Uh, told the Daily Courier that a stray bullet had hit Camille above the eye. She died two days after the shooting. Oh, poor Camille. Please say 30-year-old Joseph Carl Salmon of Grants Pass was on the run for almost three days before he was arrested on July 4th. He has four charges, including attempted murder. Court-appointed attorney Pete Smith did not immediately return a phone message to the Associated Press seeking comment. <laughs> Camille the camel. Poor Camille. She didn't deserve that. Poor camel. So do you need to go on a camel vigilante spree? Or I could read the red ghost. Read me the red ghost. All right. This one is fun. The red ghost is one of my new favorite ghost stories because there's a lot of actual history involved. The red ghost terrorized Arizona during the 1880s. It was first reported appearance was about 1883. Some people saw what they described as a giant red beast with a devil riding its back alongside a river. And when people went back to investigate the scene, they found a woman who had been trampled to death and traces of red hair stuck in the weeds and, and foliage at the scene. She's not a red-headed woman, I'm assuming. I'm guessing not. Later, a uh, cowboy reportedly tried to rope it, but it turned and charged him, killing him and his mount. A group of miners spotted it along the Verde River and pursued it, but it got away. As it got away, it shook something loose off of its back, which happened to be a rotted human skull with dried skin patches and uh, hair stuck to it. That's where I left that. <laughs> that's when you're done? That's when you're out? <laughs> no, no, I mean, oh, like, okay. that's where I left my rotted human skull. Oh, okay, gotcha. But that's probably a good time to leave. As the legend grew, the stories did also. Some witnesses claimed it was over 30 feet tall. Others said that it had devoured a grizzly bear and that it could vanish before your eyes. The Red Ghost's reign of terror finally ended when a rancher in Eagle Creek saw it eating up vegetables from his garden and shot it, killing it dead. It was then that the Red Ghost was revealed to be a camel that had straps of rawhide crisscrossing its, its body and digging into it. They, at this point, the devil rider was gone, but as near the, as they could figure, the straps were used to lash a human to the back of the camel, which had long since decayed and fallen off. Do we think the human was alive? Well, I have we so don't. many questions. There are a ton of questions, which is why I love this story. We don't, we don't really know. Uh, we do kind of have an idea where the camel came from. This is, this is really fun. In 1853, Secretary of War and future Confederate President Jefferson Davis got approval from Congress, after much lobbying and begging, to spend $30,000 on the importation of camels and dromedaries for military purposes. So this was still... Military camel. Yeah, well, this so, was... So this was a standard issue camel. Well, here's the thing. This was still decades before the Transcontinental Railroad, okay? And Davis figured the camels were the key to westward expansion, especially through the arid southwest deserts. So he got his approval, and by uh, 1857, they had 75 camels imported to the U.S. under the plan. But within 10 years, all of those camels were going to be scrapped and auctioned off. It did not last long. The, pre the, camels. the program had some success. Mostly they were based at Camp Verde in Texas. Two dozen camels made the trek from Camp Verde to Fort Tejon outside Los Angeles under the auspice of Hero of the West, Edward Beale. Edward Beale was a huge individual as far as expanding into the West. It was him who first brought back bits of gold from California and basically started the gold rush. 
It wasn't that he was mining it, it was that he went there to examine it, came back with the evidence, and everyone said, oh, there's gold in them there hills, and flooded out to the west. Beale's camel posse made the 1,500-mile uh, trek to Los Angeles in just three months, which is a feat considered impossible at the time. And uh, the routes discovered by Beale's camel caravan was used to create the Beale Wagon Road, which was the main thoroughfare for a lot of settlers to the southwest. Parts of it were eventually adopted to make the Santa Fe Railroad's contribution to the Transcontinental Railroad, and eventually Route 66 and Interstate 40. So all those can be traced back to this dude and his camels. They were important camels. Yeah, they, they made a huge contribution. Other Texan camel units were used to poke and prod at the Mexican border. They were trying to search for new and undiscovered routes. But the camels did have a downside. They tended to scare the hell out of the horses. <laughs> for and some they're reason. camels. <laughs> well, yeah, they... they would tend to, you know, camels are kind of known for being strong-willed, so they would just wander off overnight. And and though they were a great pack animal, they also had a habit of spitting with pinpoint accuracy at any handler that they don't like. <laughs> you may enjoy, I just sent you an Instagram post that happened up in our lives yesterday uh, about buying your own camel milk and why it is superior to cow's milk. When you just chop it off to the back of them with a scimitar? Uh, their humps aren't really full of milk. Oh, I know, it's a joke. But there's a lot more antioxidants. Mm. And, you know, camel toe just brings joy to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, the U.S. did abandon the camel plan. The uh, straw that broke the camel's back. But I'm bummed. bum Came from Congress, um, got a lot of pressure. From the lobbyists of the mule industry. <laughs> so if you thought lobbyists ruining things for America was a modern phenomenon, you were 100% wrong. This was going on practically forever. Fair. A further complication is that during this time, also, we experienced the secession of Texas and the South, <laughs> causing Camp Verde to fall into the hands of the Confederacy. Unfortunately, under the Confederate care, the camel security was a lot more lax, and many of them simply just wandered off when they were let loose to graze. So there could be a hidden population of camels. We well, we're going to get to that. Yeah, um, there actually was for a long, long time. <laughs> um, there are camel islands. Well, and for a while, people kept locating camels in the southwest like union forces captured three of them in arkansas uh, but they quickly auctioned them off reportedly some made it to mexico few found employment in the confederate postal service i don't know why the camel express never took off as a thing but kind of wish it would uh one camel nicknamed old douglas became the property of the 43rd mississippi infantry and was killed during the siege of vicksburg the um Poor camel. it was well and it so enraged Colonel Bevier that he enlisted his six best snipers solely to kill the Union sharpshooter that got Douglas. <laughs> I um I feel like that guy, and I might get along. <laughs> <laughs> so some feral camels did survive in the wilderness, um, but there was never enough of them to provide a thriving, sustainable herd. I believe that they're all estimated to have died out by now, but people would have chance encounters with these wild feral camels up through the 20th century. Going to be honest, a feral camel is kind of terrifying. Like, it's a little <laughs> bit less terrifying than, like, a feral emu or ostrich, yeah. but... Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Um, the origin of the Red Ghost is still something of a mystery, because... It is a famous Who camel. Who decided but... to strap a corpse to a camel's back? <gasps> yeah. It's creative. One rumor is that the rider was a soldier who was deathly afraid of the camel, so his fellow soldiers tied him to the back, so he wouldn't have to worry about falling off. And then, unfortunately, the beast took off, and the soldiers were unable to keep up the pursuit because it was a damn camel. <laughs> now I'm curious, how fast can a camel run? Siri. Uh, I, didn't hey, look, Siri I didn't look that how up. How fast can a camel run? Camels can run at up to 65 kilometers per hour, 40 miles per hour. Oh. Sustain speeds of up to 40 kilometers per hour, 25 miles per hour. So yeah, nobody's catching that thing. <laughs> cheetah. Especially, especially not a soldier in the 19th century. <laughs> We're going to have to get a cheetah to catch the camels. <laughs> now, 
Personally, I don't really like that explanation, because for that to work, when they tied the soldier up there, they would have his hands bound in such a way he couldn't get himself off, which that doesn't sound like an especially friendly event. That's that's not going to cure someone of a camel or, fear if you strap them to it and they don't get the use of their hands. They strapped him to it and then he died while he was up there. Well, like I mean, job. well, and that's the thing. If he was live when he went up there, it would take what? You know, several days, a week or so before he died. So he would have to be up there quite a while. Well, I'm saying, like, I was there an active sniper? <laughs> Somebody sniped. He was on a snipe hunt. He got sniped, and then he was just on this camel. Anybody I see ride by on a camel, I'm killing him. I'm tired of it. <laughs> Another tale tells of a rider that was too tired to hold on to the beast, so he decided to tie himself on instead, but then that puts us back in the same position of, like, why would he put himself in a position where he couldn't get himself loose? He had the dumb. He could have the dumb. I like the idea, personally, that maybe it's some kind of screwball episode of Frontier Justice, or maybe, you know, a, a death sentence carried out by a particularly creative and sadistic outlaw. <laughs> anyway, they never really did find out who the writer was. They only recovered the skull. They don't know where the rest of the body dropped. Probably in bits and pieces of the skull. Well, probably. And, and, you know, but the despite... The red ghost capture and killing, reports of a red camel being ridden by a skeleton persisted in the area for years afterwards. <laughs> so, he built a good legend up. He did his job. Today, um, in Quartzsite, Arizona, they have a bright red scrap metal sculpture of the red ghost, where they, they've lovingly named it Georgette. I don't know if they ever gave the actual red ghost a name. Old Douglas, the Confederate camel, he has a grave in Cedar Hill Cemetery in Vicksburg, Mississippi, which, fittingly, Vicksburg is Jefferson Davis's hometown. So there's there's a circular logic to the whole thing. All cycles back to the camel. It does. Jefferson Davis. <laughs> As they knew him in the Confederacy, the old camel, Jefferson Davis. That old camel, but never mind. So, you know, this isn't... A traditional ghost story because we've got some real world explanations going on but i did find a, another ghost story that kind of sprung out of this genesis so three of the camels were purchased from an army auction by a prospector named jake the soldiers warned jake that the camels were pretty ornery but jake he, he took good care of them and he had nothing but praise for them he liked them they liked him there was a, a great little relationship most bestest camels. That's right. Well, he took care of his camels. Oh. He didn't go strapping corpses to them. And eventually, Jake hit pay dirt, and he uh, led his camels into town laden with gold for the exchange. This, of course, caught the attention of a would-be claim jumper by the name of Paul Adams. He heard of Jake's success and followed him and his camels out of town. Jake was smart enough not to head back directly to his claim, so instead he took a long circular route. So long that he ended up having a camp for the night. Now, Adams, not knowing what was going on, he mistook the campsite for the actual claim, so he snuck into the camp and murdered Jake. The camels, trying to protect Jake, they attacked Adams. <laughs> One of them bit him, but eventually it got gunned down as well. Aww. Aww. So, here's Adams, stuck in the desert. He realized his mistake. He, this wasn't the claim, so he had to spend the and next... And he has a camel bite. He's got a camel bite, and whatever goes along with that, I'm assuming infection and fever. He's looking around for several days, trying to find the wherever this real claim is, since he kind of ruined his only chance to actually find it. He kept searching and searching. One night, Adams was awoken by none other than the ghost of Jake riding on the back of his camel, looking over the murderer. Adams panicked. He mounted his horse and he fled, but the camel galloped after him and continued to chase him the whole way. Eventually, Adams made it to town and he was so frightened, he confessed all of his deeds in exchange for the protection offered of the sheriff's jail cell. Huh. I mean, if me and my camel die, I'm going to haunt that fucker, too. <laughs> Me and my camel. <laughs> and that's the tale of the Riggish. I'm impressed. Now I want a camel. <laughs> okay. You want to talk about camel hair? Yeah, what kind of drink do we uh, have for camel? Not camel milk, I think. Oh, should I tell my other story first, or should we go to that? 
pretty cool another story. Or did you have another story? Or I, thought I have a gold it. story. Oh, I love gold. Story. Okay. okay, gold. I didn't know you had a gold story. I don't remember it, but I'm semi-prepared. Hold on. <laughs> he has gold. Gold. Okay, so there is the Yellow Jacket Mine in Gold Hill, Nevada. Oh. Um, so, obviously, gold rushing. I live in prime gold rush territory, so it's, like, dear to my heart. Yeah. I don't think there's any gold left. But, anyway, gold story. Gold Hill, Nevada. Gold Hill, Nevada. 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 Sorry, people of Nevada, we don't really say it like that. After I did just finish an episode about how to properly say Oregon. <laughs> Oregon? Um, anyway, so there was a gold mine, and it was underground, and in 1869, it caught on fire. Mm-hmm. So on April 7, 1869, the moaners, the mo- moaners, miners, at Gold Hill's Yellow Jacket Mine said goodbye the to their families and went to mine. work like any other day. They had no idea that many of them would never make it back home. An uncontrollable methane fire broke out in the mine at the 800-foot deep level collapsing the timbers, spreading to neighboring mines. The miners were trapped. It killed at least 35 miners. Fun fact, fortunately, this happened during a shift change. Otherwise, the death toll could have been much higher. Um, actually, I lied. I believe this was a silver mine. <laughs> I'm going to stick with it's a gold mine, though, because it works better with my drink. So they think the fire was caused by an unattended lantern, but there's others that claim that it was Set on purpose by greedy men who were trying to crash the market. None of these theories are confirmed. They believe 11 of the 35 plus dead miners haunt the mine. There are lights and blue and white orbs near the mine shaft entrance. Sounds of cries in the mines. And then there's a nearby Gold Hill Hotel and Saloon that also sees paranormal activity. They affiliate with the mine. Uh, apparitions of miners in work gear walk around near the hotel at nighttime. On the anniversary of the fire, they come out in full force. Hmm. So there's that. I was just wondering how they determined that it was only 11. I mean, I don't want to doubt them it's their ghost, but I was just wondering how they determined it was only 11 out of well, the 35. Well, I mean, you, if you're doing an actual exploration or you're sensitive and, like, discussing life, and not life with ghosts. You can, you know, you get a... I can tell if there's one or two ghosts throwing things at me most of the time. So, I suppose if you're communicating with them, to ask how many of them are around. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it's a guesstimate. Yeah. Maybe there's 12, and Frank didn't want to talk to anybody that day. We don't actually know, but it's a guesstimate of 11. (laughs) Um... There is a miner's cabin still left at the mine. The mine is private property and closed off mostly boarded up at this point in time there's some bits of it left including a cabin that is rented by the gold hill hotel Mm -hmm. so i'm gonna add this to my personal haunted road trip goals but you know between your camel gold and my miners and the fact that it just got cold finally here and you what you told me about your story is that red was an important color because you don't give me a ton about your stories ahead of time. It's the red ghost, which is, is what they call it. I just I decided to go with something red. Yeah. And gold. Sounds plausible. I think we've already established that I uh, managed a German restaurant, so like a lot of that is probably going to come out unintentionally in drinks. I don't know if talked about that on the podcast. Yeah. Huh. Well, you know, I said I was going to throw myself from a building in my nicest dirndl. Well, there's that. So I decided if I was going to make something red and gold, it's glue vine season, which is the German warm mold wine. Mm-hmm. Translates, glue vine basically translates to glow wine. And usually you drop a shot, well, in German markets, I think they, like the Christmas markets that are so famous, they typically just serve it as a wine. I like it. Wait, I have to find the actual... I think it's Glühwein mit Schuss. So that's Glühwein with a shot. So typically I would add brandy, probably Osbach because it's German, but you can, we decided to mix it up. So I made a traditional Glühwein. And the nice thing about Glühwein is if you have shitty red wine you need to get rid of, you can do this. And then you can 
happily drink your shitty red wine. I think most people have shitty red wine. They need to get rid of. Yeah. And I mean, you can use a nicer wine, but you don't need to waste that. Like, don't waste your good red wine on Glühwein. So um, I used a mid-grade. I bought wine because it had Snoop Dogg on the bottle. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> 19 Primes just released. Well, I don't know if they just released, but they released a Cali Red with Snoop Dogg in a mugshot on the bottle. So that's what I uh, use. I back it up. I was curious about the Snoop Dogg 19 Primes. Okay. I'm not going to say it's the best wine I've ever had. I tasted it. Wasn't my jam. To be fair, not a huge red wine drinker, not a wine connoisseur. Don't really know what I'm talking about when it comes to wine. So, <laughs> Aha! That's my area is the one. I know some basics, but I'm a beer girl, even though I can't have it. So basically, and you can use, you do the stove top, your house smells great. You can do it in a crock pot, which is what I did, because we have a gas stove and it's just like the cool temperatures, like, just holding something at warm on our gas stove is a little tricky. Wait, so you're, you're feeding this up? I guess, oh, because you said it was getting cold, so that's why you're feeding it up. Yeah. So we'll post a recipe, but you can use, like, molding spices. You can use pumpkin pie spice if you want. Like, it is the right assortment of spices. We're getting basic white girl on this if you want this. I mean, I'm thinking of it, you can go real easy, real, real basic. Is the word we're going to use here and use pumpkin pie spice if you'd like. And I like to think that a lot of my recipes you can play around with for your personal preferences. We don't have to drink it. If you don't really like cloves, you probably don't have to put cloves in this. <laughs> I love cloves. Sean hates cloves. So when I said, taste this, I really want to add more cloves, but I think you'll be mad at me. And he said, yes, I will be. No more cloves. We didn't put any more cloves in it. I've been known to overclove things. You gotta remember, Sean didn't grow up smoking cloves in a nice emo no. girl. Woman. He's a he's a marble red man. <laughs> no, uh, he did not grow up with a hippie mom with a house full of essential oils before that was trendy. Like <laughs> there was no dried flower business in his rec room. Yeah. Anyway, there were cloves in it. I put a little black pepper in this. I've been hunting for star anise in town, and I can't find it, so I might have to order it. I have not checked the bulk herb section. They may have it there, like the bulk spice section. It exists. It's not that rare, but I don't have it at the moment. So red wine, some pumpkin pie spice, pumpkin, pumpkin pie spice. Some spicy pumpkin. Uh, pumpkin pie spice. So, or if you don't want to use pumpkin pie spice, we're using cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, cardamom. You can use vanilla, you can use star anise, you can use black peppercorn, you can use pink peppercorn if you want, I don't care. A little orange juice, some citrus rind is great in there, and then you just let it steep and slowly cook all those spices into it, and it's delicious. And you really don't need to do any more than that, but for this particular drink challenge here, I really wanted to incorporate some sort of gold. So. Instead of topping it with brandy like I would normally do, I topped it with Goldschlager. So it gives you, you know, a little fleck of gold, some extra cinnamon, and some extra sweetness. So this blue vine, you're gonna, if you're gonna make it with the Goldschlager, you definitely want to hold back on the sugar. You're, we're still gonna sweeten the blue vine a little, but not as much as we normally would. You, you probably don't want to spice it with cinnamon in it or anything either. That's I mean, I put cinnamon in it. I just used a little bit of restraint. Yeah. Instead of like a tablespoon of cinnamon, we were closer to a teaspoon. I'll give you exact measurements, but. If we're going for gold, then we could also, you know, get super fancy and get some of that edible gold leaf, right? Yes. Um, just, you know, to make it extra gold. How much do you love gold? Oh, I love gold. Because I think the gold schlager, you know, you give it a little shake and it still only gives you so much gold at a time. Unless you're at the bottom of the barrel. And we're not at the bottom of the barrel because we don't routinely drink large amounts of gold schlager in this household. I did debate I putting it in my know. coffee this morning. Even at my lowest, I don't think you drink too much. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I've not had gold schlager, to my knowledge, since high school. I haven't had it in a large quantity since my early 20s. So, it'd be about the same time I like, 
I'm not hating on Goldschlager. It's just as an adult, I would much rather drink something with a higher alcohol content. Fair. But I do like cinnamon. Like I think I think I might put some in my coffee today or tomorrow. We'll see. We might address also that the the old wives tale about the little pieces of gold causing micro abrasions to the alcohol gets in your system faster. I don't believe it. No, that's you want to do that. That's you something chug. you only believe in high school and literally twenty. <laughs> Tequila tampons or butt chugging. These are the options. <laughs> More useful life knowledge. Um, anything else to say that? Mm. What did we decide to call this? Hair of the camel that bit us? Hair of the camel that bit us. I like that. Hair, Hair of the, the camel, camel that, that bit you? Me. Hair of the camel that bit me? That's right. Because there's not enough second person bridge names out there. There's Hair of the dog that bit you, and now Hair of the camel that bit you. That's it. That's and it. there's not enough camels in drinking. At least in this part of the world. I mean, there's lots of drinks that can't get past. That's <laughs> I'm wondering, can we reach out to some of our Middle Eastern friends to see if there's camel drinks there? Well, it's a largely Muslim population. And they don't drink alcohol, so that's okay, can we reach out to our military friends that have spent deployments in the Middle East? Sean has left the house. I'll report back on drunk camels. All right. Thanks for hanging out with us on Booze and Spirits podcast for weekly shenanigans and nonsense, bi-weekly. We're bi-weekly here, I forget. Um, we're we're bi here. I'm not really bi-curious. <laughs> waste stuff. <laughs> only care about waste stuff. All right. Uh, um, the next week is going to be our Christmas episode. We normally do every other Friday. But this one we're going to release a little early so, so that we can do it on, we can release a new episode on Christmas Eve. Because we are going to bring back the classic and Victorian tradition of telling scary stories on Christmas Eve. As well as the classic Victorian tradition of child labor. I'm <laughs> shoving my baby in a chimney. <laughs> and I'm going to die of black lung at 30. And I'm going to faint a few times. <laughs> it's a win-win-win. <laughs> Be sure to check our show notes for the recipe and other fun information about this episode. Uh, remember, you can catch this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, uh, as well as several other podcast resources. Follow us on the Instagrams. Yeah. You can check out our website, boozeandspirits.com. Instagram is at boozeandspiritspodcast. Uh, our YouTube is boozespirit, B O O S. Please drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. We are not responsible if you get drunk and do something stupid. We have enough to deal with with our own drinking stupidity. That was a determinant. We are wiping our hands clear of all the sudden. I declare bankruptcy! <laughs> Thanks, and we will see... You know what? And I'm going to have a special uh, background for the YouTube edition of the podcast for the Christmas one also. I've been working hard on it. It's not just pictures of children shoved in chips. No, because we got flagged for that before. <sighs> okay. Good talk. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. Bye.